I'm Dana Denha, and you're watching a special anniversary edition of FYI. CTN's news and information magazine program has been a staple to the Ann Arbor community since 1992, creating over 1,000 episodes in its 30-year history. In the second part of our celebration, watch some of the standout guests and topics that took place in the CTN studio in these in-depth interview segments. Hi, and welcome to FYI. I'm your host, Dana Denha. And I'm here today with Tim Grimes, the Community Relations and Marketing Manager for the Ann Arbor District Library, and William Poy Lee, the author of The Eighth Promise. This is the book chosen for the Ann Arbor Ypsilanti Reads. So Tim, why don't you tell me kind of what Ann Arbor Ypsilanti Reads is all about? Oh, okay, Dana, this is actually the, gosh, the sixth year for Ann Arbor uh, Ypsilanti Reads. When they said convergence of uh, city life and school life, just the word convergence immediately put the uh, uh, image in my head of two walls converging together. And I thought, why not make a painting about two paintings coming together? And uh, I, once again, I saw the alley and I thought, you know, people like to stand in front of a painting, but you can get more viewers if you look at it from this angle. And I know everybody knows those sidewalk drawings where it's like an optical illusion. Have you ever seen those? They're all over the yeah, internet. Yeah, yeah, where you like feel like you could just like walk or jump right into it, yeah. Right, so I thought, well, wouldn't that be neat to have something that you could see from all the way across the street, you know? That was kind of a, a big change from starting at the lowest point of the social order, yeah. just getting here as an immigrant, to um, finally being at such a fine institution in a professional school and then becoming uh, the president and the representative of the whole student community at the school. It was just, uh, it was just something that, in the moment I just did it, and then reflecting back on it, I said, wow, like, where, you know, looking back to when I got here as a middle schooler, um, it's just such a huge change. So that's kind of the, the, the gist of the story. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said, there, that's just mine. And I think my, mine is a good story, but there are so many other more inspirational stories that are out there of immigrants doing bigger and better things. Um, mine is just happens to be the one that gets, the, gets talked about in this particular movie. And I know when I was voting, I had no question in my mind to pass that millage for affordable housing in this area. Because Ann Arbor's at a point right now where I told my husband if we would have wouldn't have bought when we did, we would have been priced out of Ann Arbor. So anyone that's in a lower income bracket than us is definitely gonna be priced out if you don't have these affordable housing options for people. Yeah, I mean and yeah, I appreciate you supporting that. <laughs> it's um you know, that moment when you move people into housing and, 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 and you're with them and they're with the landlord and you're signing the lease. Now it's all remote, so it's a little different, but um, they're getting that lease signed and they're getting their keys, especially that keys moment. It, it, I, I, one thing I, I, I ask people to think about is when you move into your own, a new home yourself, how great that feels. Imagine if you didn't have a home before that. Yeah. Um, and that security that it brings and the safety and uh, um, just, that it's an incredible moment uh, and it keeps you going. How the market kind of started and evolved over this last yeah, 100 I mean, years. It's just amazing we've been around for 100 years. That's a like huge accomplishment. Hard to wrap my mind around. Um, so it actually was started by a women's group organization in 1919. And they set out on Main Street um, by the courthouse. Uh, but, you know, eventually that got too crowded. It was in a crowded spot. And so in the 30s, uh, we moved to our current location, which was an old lumber yard. Mm -hmm. And then it got converted into the farmer's market. And then um, in the 40s, during the work progress era construction projects, um, they actually built that shed that you see yeah. now when you come to the market. Um, and so that was built in the 40s, and we've been there ever since. Bob was a coach before this, so you were like the epitome of active. Yeah, and I um, um, had great joy working with young children like Kate. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I was diagnosed, my oldest daughter was about Kate's case, age right now. And um, um, I think because I enjoyed coaching youngsters like Kate, the board decided to focus a lot of their energy on events where children are happily involved. For 
Is there proof that this um, animal therapy actually works on its patients? Absolutely, absolutely. They have scientific evidence that working with dogs reduces pain levels. I've seen this again personally, myself, on, on several different levels. I was working with an individual who had a very, very deep leg wound, terrible, terrible wound. Uh, they called us in with the dog and they literally got to cut her medication in half. Why don't you tell me a little bit about the book? Like, what mm -hmm. are people going to learn about in this book? We have we have it broken down. Um, the, I I always learn something about history. The thing that I thought was really interesting is just looking at all the restaurants that used to be here. There's I know it's no way is it exhaust. It's not an exhaustive list, but Britton and I really tried to list as many restaurants as we could yeah. to bring back. Hopefully, bring back some happy memories. Um, Every time I go on the townies page on Facebook, I see another restaurant. I'm like, oh no, we forgot to put that in there. But we're really hoping to bring back some pleasant memories from those. Um, mm -hmm. We did a section on the arcades that used to be here. We did a section on uh, just the general merchandise mm -hmm. and like lines and uh, the downtown Sears that used to be here and uh, one-off department stores. Yeah, mm -hmm. and Beagles. And it's it's great entertainment for a great value. Um, you know, Broadway show tickets are sky high right now, and I think these performances are top notch. Um, and I think a family road trip, whether it's a day journey to Grandpa's house or a two week vacation across the country, everyone has experienced that sometime or the other. And I think everyone will find something in the play that they can relate to and laugh at. And it is very funny. Um, it's been a wonderful experience creating humor out of the scenes themselves because a lot of things we do aren't necessarily told to do in the script and it's fun developing the physical comedy as well as hearing the lines written by these playwrights who've done a wonderful job in, in the language of the play as well. So he started to announce the show and as the airplane's flying in front of us he would say, well, now he's turning around there. Oh, here he comes. There he goes. <laughs> so I knew he was in trouble. And my friends were all out there flying their hearts out in these stunt airplanes. I didn't want to have him lose face, so I went up behind him. I said, I'll whisper the maneuvers to you, and you can repeat them over the microphone. And he, let's say this is a microphone. He turned around and looked at me with these big eyes like this. And he handed me the mic with both hands. <laughs> and honest to gosh, the last saw, thing I saw were the heels of his shoes. He was headed for the hospitality. He, he was gone forever. <laughs> so uh, there was my opportunity. And I can't say that I wasn't ready because I had studied other great announcers as a spectator. And I knew what my style would be. And I knew the maneuvers. And I knew the personalities of the pilots. And I knew the history of their airplanes, the performance of the airplanes. So, uh, I was, I was ready, and that led to the second one, to the third one, which was interrupted some weeks later by an offer to get an airline job. So that fall of 65 was a very good time for me. So both careers were launched back then. I, I honestly don't remember, you know, I couldn't remember five minutes afterwards oh, yeah. <laughs> how, how each game had progressed, like how I had been doing, what the ups and downs were. Watching the shows on TV, uh, I finally saw like, oh, I was kind of trailing for a while there. Mm -hmm. I, I felt pretty good about how I was doing, but I, I was, it was kind of scary. Yeah. If I didn't know that I was going to win this game, I would be a little worried. I think that I ended up getting a daily double. Um, and that really helped your game. It helped me out a lot. Um, I made a kind of a, a big wager, and that gave me a lot of um, kind of breathing room mm -hmm. right near the end of the game, I think. You know, the very first couple of days we spent a lot of time uh, just learning how to find things in the soil. Uh, they cut these pieces of sections of dirt, they lift them up, they put them into a wheelbarrow, and then you just start to pull them apart, kind of like pulling apart pages of a book. And that's where the artifacts are. And at first, everything seems like it's an artifact, and then you get a little bit better at it. You start to find, you know, what is really an artifact, what is just a piece of wood. And the preservation here is so good that you're finding pretty much everything that was, you know, dropped off in the past. And after a couple of days, you get better at it. Uh, after a couple of days, people start going actually down in the trenches, actually doing the actual digging mm -hmm. uh, down in the trenches. 
And by the time we had finished up our second week, we were doing just pretty much everything that everybody else at the site was doing. When I was younger, I used to like to help my mom out in the kitchen, and I just fell in love with baking. I have been baking more seriously the past couple of years because I can take stuff in and out of the oven. Mm -hmm. So you have a few kids, right? I do. Yeah, and you were baking with all of them. Is Jane the only one that really stuck with yeah, definitely. I mean, the boys, of course, love to sample the things that we make. And, and the funny part of all the baking is that I've always baked for the kids, but not, not that many sweets. And Jane, I think, really got motivated because I wouldn't make that many sweet treats and she would want them. And so once she was able to take them in and out of the oven, instead of having to get my permission, she just started to be able to do it herself. And you know, another, um, another way that people can experience music this summer, there's this other anchor series called Tiny Tops. And I did want to ask you about yeah. this because this is one that you know you're basically like reserving a spot in your backyard, right? Yeah, and, and so you know most of what we're doing is free, but this 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 is a uh, something you have to purchase. But this is another kind of anchor program where you can um, uh, pay for a, a performance in your your backyard or, or front yard or um, you know space nearby your house and, and invite your family or a small group of friends. These are acoustic you know concerts. They're really kind of musical moments. They're designed to be short, twenty minutes or so in length. The artists are setting their fee, uh, and the summer festival is, is passing 100% of that fee to the artists. And what we've done is uh, put together a roster that people can choose from on our website. Uh, and and um, artists are gonna go around on, on di different days and perform uh, a bunch of these these small shows. And it's a nice way to, to gather friends um, if you're already having a party or a gathering and, and support um, local artists. A lot of emotion mm -hmm. in that sense, which is, which is very difficult, you know, to, but interesting to do, but wonderful, wonderful. I have to say, play. this is by far the hardest character mm -hmm. that I've had to play. And it definitely, I feel like you get really involved with your character when you're, because you're doing so much. I mean, you're, we're meeting five days a week. When I'm not meeting with you guys, I'm still looking at it. And I feel like the character actually starts to become like a part of your right. personality. Oh, and yeah. I, and, and Brooke is not, an easy person to live with. No, and I think the interesting thing with Brooke too is she's an artist. She has this gift of writing, but if she publishes this book, it will hurt okay. her family. Mm -hmm. And she and the father are very, very close. So that's the difficult thing. How do you stay true to your art and what you want to do, but exactly. yet knowing that if that's published, it will hurt someone you love. And the same thing with me, it's difficult to have the daughter that I love and wanting to support her but then if she does this, it will hurt. There's consequences. Hurt Do you feel more than a you know, paper route or something that you would have <laughs> yeah. on a side job? Um, so any plans with it or any gifts to maybe like mom and dad who helped you out or a little bit for yourself? What, what are some of your uh, plans with that? Oh, well with my money, I'm definitely gonna either take my mentor out to a really nice restaurant or give him like a really nice knife or something like that. I'm gonna spend maybe uh, I'm gonna spend a little bit on myself, and um, I'm gonna save a little bit for education. So to get this surgery and to get the extra skin removed, I can't imagine what my body's gonna look like and how I'm gonna feel because because I have to keep it shoved in all the time. If you saw the show, you saw all the loose skin that I do have, and I keep yeah, it. Yeah, you really in. put it on display. You showed us. That. I did, <laughs> and you know what? I you know what? That's one of the things of being a nurse. Look at. I deal with people and their bodies every day, so I'm not ashamed to show people because I think people want to know and people want to see. And it's reality. That's it is. What I'm not ashamed of it. Look, it's just skin, you know, and I want to show people how far I've come. And when they first showed uh, my staff and myself recordings of it, some of us have been working in the museum. I've been there 46 years. I've never seen anything like it. This unique polyphonic vocal tradition and it, it you know, it, it was so singular, but you immediately understand it in on, on some levels. On, on one hand, it's mysterious because you know I I uh, you know have very little understanding of of this traditional culture, but you know just understanding how they're working as musicians, how how they're listening so carefully to each other and responding in, in all these little subtle ways that it's it's very ancient and it's it's super contemporary sounding too. So it was such an exciting thing to see. He was unfortunately taken out of the nest illegally in Ohio 
And the family that had him, um, had him when he was very young. And so when his eyes began to focus, they focused in on people. So he's imprinted on humans. So he identifies with us. He doesn't identify with other Which barn owls. Which is definitely unusual for it's, an owl. Exactly. I mean, because of that, you can't release them. You might be able to teach them how to hunt, but if they can't find anything, they'll always come back to people. And then come mating time, that really messes up with their mind. And usually what happens is that they focus in on people as competition and they try to scare them away. And that can be pretty dangerous. Well, the feeling was in 1970, a lot of the events that were going on were easy to pinpoint as being cause and effect. So for example, um, the Rouge River in Detroit area and the Cuyahoga River in uh, Ohio were infamous for being on fire for days on end. But you could easily connect it to you know, a discharge spout that was putting oils into the river and that would, that would set on fire. Um, likewise, we knew that we were having lots of creatures become endangered, our, our bald eagle, the eggs were crushing um, as the bird would sit on their nest and we could trace that back to DDT in the food chain that then was having this biological effect within the birds and, and people could see how the runoff from the soils was getting into the waters and affecting that. So it was a pretty direct cause and effect and you and lots of landmark legislation and EPA started and lots of things were able to happen to address those kinds of concerns and that kind of awareness. Now it's a more diffuse, uh, it's not a linear cause and effect kind of thing. It's more our footprints, our carbon footprints that really are less tangible. They're going up in the air, discharges from another community or country are affecting the conditions and the stability of the planet. And all that's a little hard to put the wine cork back in the bottle and manage that genie. And so I, I can understand people feeling a little uncomfortable about addressing big issues, but that's our challenge. I mean, it's a strange thing to be an expert on. I'm an expert on packaged candy and bottled soda pop, but here I am. Uh, <laughs> really, it, I think the fun, fun for me is when somebody comes back and they're like, hey, Last time I was here, you recommended X. What can you recommend today? You know, it's me. That's the greatest honor you could pay me. That means that I, I gave you a good suggestion. You came back looking for me to, to do it again. So um, that's that's a lot of fun. But yeah, having having a good team that's really engages the people. That's such a big part of what we do. We're we're an experience. You know, so our team. You has guys to try to try all of your. You know, like you have like that weird stuff. Like if you ranch dressing <laughs> pop and stuff, you try that stuff. Yeah, we do. So, like, I'm I'm about 400 plus soda varieties in at this point, um, but it doesn't mean I'm drinking a whole bottle. It's it's typically. Oh no, I mean not every flavor is for everyone, right? No, and, and and typically, you know, when we're together in a group and somebody buys a, buys a pop, we'll have little plastic shot glasses, and we'll kind of have you tried this one yet? Nope. Okay, now you can try it. So we all get to try it that way. Same thing when we open a candy. One of the things you spoke about was discussing your dreams with other people. Yes. How does that affect? you remembering them or how your connection is to them? Well, it affects you remembering them because, you know, you want to do something with your dreams. You don't just leave them hanging loose and you don't want to reduce them to some boring verbal analysis. You want to learn a way of talking to a friend by which you can create a safe space for each other to talk about your dreams of the night or your dreams of life and get some helpful feedback from each other and be guided towards action. I've invented this process. It's called the lightning dream work. It has a very few steps. You can do it in a few minutes with just about anybody. And it accomplishes those things. You learn to tell your story. And by the way, there's power in learning to tell your story in life and hold your audience, whether you're telling a dream or telling something else. You know that, you do that well. Stuck here in this, uh, what we call the alcove, sort of this uh, hallway or sitting room upstairs. He was here sort of in this, this uh, kind of a public space. Well, we're on the outside of the house now. Why don't you talk about the architecture of this home and how it's something that's recognized nationally now? It's a great example of uh, the Temple Front Greek Revival. It was built in 1853 by the Bennett family. Uh, Henry Bennett was a uh, secretary at, of the university and uh, postmaster here in Ann Arbor. And so the Greek Revival was a very popular style. It, it looks like it's only one story from the front, but of course it is two stories. It's really this great kind of high style, although they, 
the columns are technically piers. It was cheaper to build square columns uh, than to round and fluted ones. The uh, freeze windows have cast iron grills that would have been produced in an iron foundry. Uh, quite a handful of different ways to be involved in our organization. There's little bits on the weekends on a Saturday for three hours, to ad hoc sort of just join up, bring the family out and have fun with somebody from our field staff or uh, an advanced volunteer that might be the leader for the day. And we try to disperse those events throughout all the parks um, so that everybody can get to their own neighborhood na natural area. And, um, and so those are, those are little bits of things. You can come to all those or just a couple. Uh, also have uh, more prolonged volunteer experiences where there might be a little bit more or a lot more advanced knowledge that's needed. So coming up immediately on March 1st, we have a frog and toad and salamander survey kickoff. So it's a training uh, for volunteers. It teaches them how to go out to what specific locations, learn how to collect the data. So we, we listen for frogs and toads. They peep, 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 peep. And that's the frogs calling to each other. It's their mating courtship sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And that's really fun to go out and listen to and you, you kind of tell how many there are. And so you write that down. And so we teach volunteers how to write what down and how to train the ear for different species and, and then how to, how to get that information back to us so that then we can take it and help us make better management decisions to improve uh, the parks in different ways. Well, first of all, history is not the most sexy subject in the world. However, in order for us to keep African-American history alive, we have to have people to come out and help us do that. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of what Martin Luther King used to call foot soldiers who we won't ever know their names. And Juneteenth is a way that we get to learn little tidbits of information that you otherwise may not know. Mm -hmm. uh, and we talk about how, how important it is to recognize our ancestors. If you think about it, African Americans went from being almost totally illiterate when the Civil War ended to being almost totally literate in less than a generation. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge accomplishment. Oh, yeah. So there are, there are tidbits of information that you'll find out, find out from Juneteenth, but more important than that, you'll have a lot of fun while you're there prefer to write for children, but at that point I went to see a spy novel and I said to my friend Paul McGlynn, boy Paul, if I couldn't write a better story than that. And he said, well, why don't you? So I did, but it was not as easy as I thought it would be. <laughs> uh, it was quite strenuous, but that was accepted. So I wrote a trilogy of spy novels under a fake name, of course. I didn't want people to think I was writing scholarly books and espionage novels on the side. And so I wrote scholarly stuff, Book of Folk Tales, um, a study of a secret diaries of a person who worked at Drury Lane Theatre, and uh, ran the two things, you know, concurrently. And as long as they kept accepting them, then I kept on writing them. So why fantasy? It's such a different sort of writing. I've been astonished at the reaction of people. Uh, I personally prefer fantasy of all kinds of children's literature. It's always my favorite. And people seem to have a resistance to it, and I don't understand it, because we just had seven or eight or nine or 15 films about Harry Potter. Lord of the Rings. And the Lord of the Rings was an enormous financial success which amazed me and they're just going to remake The Hobbit and I don't understand where this reluctance was coming from. Again because I've been the music teacher here for so long I can see my students from preschool all the way through fifth grade and so if I want them to be at a certain place in fifth grade I can start them you know in preschool and kind of work our way up and you know it's the students know me I know the students and so like they they know what my expectations are they know kind of what to expect when they come to music class and you know they're excited when they come we do fun things um, they learn in game-like ways and you know they can see 
themselves progressing as well, which is, is great. Like they, they notice when, okay, let's say we're playing the ukulele and they're able to play more and more chords and they can see their progress or we're singing complicated things in three part harmony and it gets easier and easier for them to do the more they do it. What we need to remember is that amphibians actually, they drink water differently than we do. You know, even the water that is in our mugs right here could be dangerous to them potentially straight out of the tap. There's chloramines in there and chlorine and stuff that can actually kill them because when they drink water, they're actually just absorbing it through their skin. So anything that could be on your hands from hand sanitizer, you know, we, we have a different definition as humans of clean than mm -hmm. nature does. And in nature, clean means something completely different. And a lot of the things that we use to clean ourselves, <laughs> a lot of things that we use to clean ourselves is actually dangerous to them. And they yeah. can absorb it into their skin. Hand lotion, perfumes, anything. So I always try to make sure that everyone knows that, you know, I want to touch them on our skin with, with our hands. We're fortunate to be here in this area, actually, because we have a lot of really cool amphibians, specifically salamanders. We have a lot of salamanders mm -hmm. here. And, you know, the, with their sensitivity in their skin, there are oils on our fingers even naturally that occur that can damage these animals. You know, there are salamanders that will absorb it instantly in the, in the skin, just our skin contacting them can kill them. So we have to be very careful. So I always try to tell people, don't touch amphibians unless you really have to. Yeah. And so when you say like, so let's say you had like a toad like this as a pet um, and you say you're saying tap water isn't necessarily the best thing for them. Where do you get your water source? It's from true. So there's actually some chemicals out there that will make tap water safe. And then what I try to do just there on the side of caution is I actually age water. So I allow it to kind of like detoxify itself. Mm -hmm. um, I age water that we ever use for taps. It's going to come in contact with amphibians for over 24 hours before it ever touches their skin. He's, she's looking at me right now because she knows I'm her food source, which is another really important distinction. You mentioned pets. Um, you know, we, I, I, it's actually illegal to have these animals as pets because mm -hmm. they live where we live. You know, there are plenty of animals out on the, on the pet market where you can get those animals and take care of them, but it's important to leave these animals out in the wild where they, they belong. Something happened to your home yes. that caused you guys to kind of take notice that Lily needed a little bit more help if there was an emergency. Um, so a tornado hit my house a couple of years ago, and um, I realized then that people like Lily are very vulnerable in a situation um, like weather or a fire. And um, that really uh, put a damper on our summer. But that whole summer, we, um, I looked up. It's something for your bed. Like a weather <laughs> alarm system. Yeah that go, there's something that goes under your pillow and it alerts and notifies um, people. The, the light is so bright that even like blind people can see it. Mm -hmm. And it's really loud that um, and most of the time people can hear it. Um, then it also shakes, the, there's something that rattles and shakes. Yeah. So it'll shake your head basically and it'll be able to wake you up in um, a fire, carbon monoxide and uh, weather. So in 2013, my mom unfortunately passed away from ovarian cancer. She was only 56. So that was in May. So in December, I was really struggling with um, not having that pair of slippers to buy for her because that was kind of our annual tradition with her. So I reached out to a friend that I worked with and she said, you know, why don't you just start like a small foundation and just give slippers away? So that first year in 2013, I gave away um, 55 pairs of slippers to two shelters. And since then I've grown into a 501c3 nonprofit. We um, donate between 500 to 1000 slippers every kind of holiday season. Um, and it's really just been a way to help deal with my own grief, but then also really give back to the community and see the tremendous work that the shelters and various organizations are doing to support people. Stay tuned for part three of FYI's 30th anniversary 1000th episode milestone celebration. For more on this and other programs, visit a2gov.org slash ctn. Visit youtube.com slash ctn Ann Arbor to see all that we have to offer and remember to like, subscribe, and ring that notification. Thanks for watching and tune in next time to FYI. Mm -hmm.